in the National Pediatric HIV Technical Working Group, the HIV Care and Treatment Technical Working Group, and is the Assistant Chair to the National HIV Third Line Committee. Today, she is presenting to us on treatment failure and HIV drug resistance. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so this presentation is going to be around treatment failure, but also on HIV drug resistance basics. The objectives of this um, presentation are to know the types of treatment failure clearly, to understand the commonest causes of treatment failure, to become familiar with the basics of HIV drug resistance, and to be able to interpret basic phenotypes. So before we get started on treatment failure, I want to remember why this is essential to recognize, because the goals of our HIV treatment are to support a healthy and productive life for our clients, right? So this means both to reduce opportunistic infections, hospitalizations, HIV-related comorbidities and deaths, but also to improve the growth and development of our children living with HIV. Treatment is also, of course, a really important means of prevention, both horizontally and vertically. So to provide effective treatment with suppressed viral loads not only supports the patient, but the population level HIV control. And it's very important that all of us as prescribers are good stewards of these medications. We have to remember that everything we do to their regimens today need to ensure robust regimens for years and decades to come. So I really want to make sure all of us that are practicing today understand the treatment experience of our clients that have been on treatment since the early days. Of course, in Eswatini, we started treating between 2004 and 2008. Most people with low CD4s had access to the NNRTI-based regimens. Most of those were twice daily, and most of those initially were nevirapine-based. Certainly, all children were nevirapine-based. Then, as the years went on, 2008 to 2013, um, still primarily, we were able to focus on first-line treatment. We weren't seeing as many treatment failures that early days in the, in the epidemic. Um, we began to use lopinavir and the protease in inhibitors in our children that had failed the MTCT. So in these days, we were looking at the child's road to health cards. We were doing a lot of investigation on their past medical history to decide which treatment to start them on. So those that failed that had been getting nevirapine prophylaxis were put on protease inhibitors, but those that did not get prevention of mother-to-child transmission were still put on NNRTIs. Also during this time period, um, the higher weight bands particularly were exposed or provided efavirenz, which allowed for once daily dosing for some of our clients, and this was really a game changer for adherence issues. Then following that period, um, there was a lot of studies on lopinavir and protease inhibitors in our infants and young children, and the survivability was so much greater, and the baseline resistance to the NNRTIs was so high that we began to initiate all of our young children on protease inhibitors which until that time and in adults at that time was still really reserved for second line treatment. This meant that any baby being started on treatment was already being started on effective second line and we didn't have a lot left for them should they fail. And we, at this point, started really being able to identify the clients that were failing and realize that we were seeing some early signs of HIV drug resistance at a population level and we needed a lot more options. And then in the last few years, of course, we've been lucky enough to have the introduction of the NSD class of drugs. A few clients did have access to raltegravir, not many, and we'll talk about why that is moving forward. Um, but also the dolotegravir was rolled out for our clients. It provided an incredibly robust once daily first line and second line treatment option for many of our, of our clients. At this point, we are starting to see a lot of people that have failed on those initial NNRTIs, failed on protease inhibitors, and now, unfortunately, even clients failing on the, the NSTs. 
We've identified about nine as a national third line committee in the country at this point, one of whom is only a pediatric client. So let's begin talking a little bit about the causes and categories of treatment failure. Of course, remembering that clinical failure was all we were able to identify in those early days. We would see clients that had been on treatment who now were sick again. This, of course, followed what was happening with their CD4 count, and that was immunologic failure. We would see initial rise in the CD4 and then a drop when their therapy was no longer working. Um, and finally, with the introduction of viral loads and the expansion of access to viral loads, we would see virological failure. And of course, this is something that happens over time. The first thing that will occur in a client is we will see the viral load rise. Only following that do you see the drop in CD4 and then the sick clients. So this again just really helps us to remember how important the response to a high viral load must be. We have a window before anybody gets sick or loses their drugs and we have to make sure to make the best of that time. So let's talk a little bit about causes of treatment failure because HIV drug resistance is one, but it's probably the least common. Um, we may see treatment failure because of drug-drug interactions. In our pediatric P um, HIV DR program, our first client in 2014 was identified uh, with protease inhibitor resistance due to co-administration of phenobarbital. Um, similarly, we've seen a lot of protease inhibitor resistance in our young children after misuse of TB co-administration with the protease inhibitors. We also might see it because of malabsorption um, or drug food in interaction with clients. And that's why it's really important that we are good to these medications and understand the co-administration very clearly. Um, another cause of treatment failure may be an OI or an intercurrent illness. You may see a blip, a small blip at viral load or a small drop in CD4 when someone's sick. Similarly, you may see a high viral load in a client with an inadequate regimen. So this may be a client that's just as decided, for instance, if they're on a PI and uh, FDC with two NRTIs, that they prefer to take the small little TDF3TC pill, but that the, the adazanavir pill, which as we all know is enormous, is too big. So they decide to just take half of their regimen. But it may also be that we as prescribers have made a mistake. Um, and not explain clearly what the clients need to give to the babies or the, uh, the children or adolescents. Um, similarly, we may forget to weigh our children or we may be refilling with them not present. And when we do that, we are maybe, um, we're putting them at risk of, of not dose adjusting their medication and providing suboptimal um, therapeutic doses of those ARVs. So resistance is one of these reasons. And I listed it almost last here, just to remind us that resistance is really the least likely of all of these options. Um, by far the commonest is the last, which is poor adherence. As we all know, that's an incredibly complex issue and it, and it varies depending on who we are treating. Um, but it means that adherence really is the most important piece of this complex puzzle if we want to provide uh, or prevent um, treatment failure. So just a reminder that our second line treatment options for our clients on protease inhibitors and dolutegravir are incredibly strong at this point. It takes at least two years, at least um, with the PIs, and we're thinking also with dolutegravir to develop real resistance mutations. So that gives us two years to really identify those clients that aren't suppressing, figure out why, and provide the support that they need. And remember that this long-term treatment success is really relying on that. We have to check early, check often, and respond swiftly to any detectable viral load in our clients. So um, there are different reasons, of course, that our clients fail. So for our children, um, it may be that the medicine that we are providing them is not palatable. A lot of our under fives, as we all know, we're exposed to some very complex drugs. The lopinavir syrup was very um, unpalatable. And then we also offered them granules or pellets, which were difficult to administer. Any of us that are parents know that providing um, even something that as, as tasty as Panadol to our children can be frustrating and difficult. And so palatability becomes a really big issue. This is one of the reasons we're really excited to offer our pediatric DTG much, much uh, better tolerated. 
and yet our, our little ones are still uh, falling behind in our 95, 95, 95. Another important uh, barrier to adherence we need to remember to investigate in any child or adolescent um, is the caregiver rotation. Our babies are often with their moms for some amount of time, but many families need to then take advantage of gogos or aunties to help care for the little children when the mother maybe goes away for work or for school. Sometimes during this process without support from the clinic, the disclosure is not done properly to that new caregiver, or perhaps that new caregiver doesn't understand how to give the medication and the sign off wasn't clear. And this is why it's so important that every time we re refill our ARVs for our children, we really make sure that we know who is the one that's giving the medicine. I find at Baylor, many times the mother will bring the child, but when you delve into this question, someone else at home is actually in charge of giving the treatment to the child. That's a really, really important piece of the puzzle that without good um, history taking, you may miss and you may not be able to support. Similarly, food insecurity, I think, is a rising challenge for many of our families. Many families find it very difficult to focus on giving ARVs properly when there's no food in the home. Talking about how we, even in times of food insecurity, the essential um, administration of ARVs is important for our clients. Also, when we talk about when to give their, the children and adolescents and adults really uh, their treatment, we need to be sure we're not being too strict with the time. So many families try to um, give, for instance, at 7 a.m. every day. Then if you're an adolescent and you're sleeping in and you sleep till nine, they wake up and they think, oh, it's too late, I, I shouldn't take my pills today. It's really important that we talk about how the ideal is one way, but the reality of life is also that we may need to be a little bit flexible in the time frame in which we take our, our medicine if, um, if we expect them to take it every day. Similarly, delve into their cultural beliefs. Really try and figure out what is the barrier in this family um, that may be affecting the children's uh, adherence to treatment. And if we haven't empowered our caregivers with really good health literacy, um, it's going to be more difficult for them to understand why and how to give the treatment. So to me, that's really um, an onus on all of us as healthcare providers to make sure that all of our clients and their families understand the importance of proper adherence and viral load suppression. For adolescents, there's a few more additional issues. As you know, between seven and 10 years of age, um, we try to make sure that we have disclosed to all of our children. Unfortunately, many kids have fallen through the cracks and we all see every week a few younger and even older adolescents that don't have a clear understanding of their HIV status. This is not only important for their adherence, but also for transmission of HIV. Um, and when disclosure isn't done properly, maybe some children have been lied to about what their treatment is for, or it's done in a kind of one-off flippant way, they have a really hard time accepting their status. And this leads to stigma both from their peers and their teachers and partners, but also of their self and, of, and accepting their own status. Um, I think we all can continue to talk about stigma with our clients and their families, also in our communities, because despite the fact that we live in the country with the highest HIV in the world, continue to experience really um, intense stigma. And I saw one of my clients yesterday in our challenge clinic who told me his teacher said to the entire class of adolescents that people that were living with HIV were dead people walking and that any of them on ARVs were just delaying death, delaying the inevitable. And that was very difficult for him to, to sit through. Um, similarly, in adolescents, um, our patients get tired. They're tired of taking this medicine every day of their life. They're starting to understand that this isn't something that's gonna go away. And they just they just need to be empathized. Um, so pill fatigue is real, and I think we need to talk about it a little bit more. Similarly, we may be seeing some substance abuse, um, especially on weekends. There tends to be some binge drinking. Um, and I think, again, if we make a safe space for our adolescents to discuss this, we can kind of strategize with them. Finally, I just want to make sure we touch on depression because I think untreated depression and anxiety in our clients, particularly our adolescent clients, is a very common reason for treatment failure. Um, we have started using the PHQ-9 in the country. It is in the new guidelines. We find it a very effective tool here at Baylor. And luckily, we do have access to fluoxetine in our, in our central medical supplies. So, um, 
treating depression can make profound impacts, not only on someone's treatment success, but on their school performance um, and the quality of life of their, at home with their families. <clears throat> so please screen and treat depression. So there are um, many ways in which we can improve adherence. To me, the most important is that we really are flexible and spend time to get to know our families that are struggling. This is why we have high viremia clinics, so we can spend a little bit more time with our patients, have a consistent team of people seeing those clients. To do, but ask them what they think they should do. Um, we find it much more effective. Similarly, you need to be flexible with the reminders that you suggest. Some people do great with alarms. Some people find that very stigmatizing and hate the sound of the alarm. Um, some prefer to use something they do every day like a television show or a radio show as their reminder so that everyone in the house doesn't know what they know before they finish the show that they swallow their tablets. Um, we haven't had pill boxes as of late, but many of our children and adolescents who really want to take their medicine but are simply forgetting and don't have support at home to help them remember, find a pill box a really Unfortunately, I just want to remind everyone that when you put the atazanavir in a pill box, it will melt, so that can't be done. Um, similarly, a treatment buddy or a family member in the homestead can be helpful, and we're trying to really make better use of our peer-peer counselors, which there's a ton of evidence in the region showing it's incredibly effective. I want to spend one moment here just discussing dots. I know we use dots a lot, but um, I would suggest that in adolescence, we use it a little bit differently. Again, empowering the adolescents to take a little bit of control of their own life and just have a backup in place. So working with the adolescents, you decide what time of day works best for them. They set that time and agree with their caregiver what that time will be. Every day, they are given a chance to do it on their own because ultimately that feels better for everybody. If they don't, after a certain set amount of time that you decide and agree upon with the family, then that family member can, re can remind that adolescent. We also ask that when they do go and take their medicine, they bring their medicine to their caregiver. They show the caregiver that, look, okay, look, I remembered on my own and I'm swallowing my tablet. That DOTS is a little less paternalistic and tends to be a little more successful in adolescent patients. Okay, so we do all this, we try our best after we see that there is a high viral load. How do we know if it's working? There are a couple of nonspecific things that we can see from routine labs. Um, one is if they're on AZT, you may see an elevated MCV. It's usually greater than 100. If they're on atazanavir, you may see an elevated bilirubin. You also might just see a healthy, happy, growing child. But there's not really any great predictor of adherence. Obviously, just because a mother has an undetectable viral load, that doesn't mean the child will be suppressed, and that doesn't mean that the child's getting their treatment consistently. A growing and happy and and a healthy child could just be a slow progressor. Um, and our patients learn very quickly how to pill count. So the pill count, I really don't put too much onus on. Um, for me, it's all about viral load. And that's why in Eswatini, we've advocated for all children and adolescents to get viral loads every six months. This is how we react quickly when there's a problem and we prevent HIV drug resistance, which is really the goal. So we do them routinely. We make sure all of our children and adolescents are getting these tests, and we act quickly. It's great to put a suppressed adolescent on six-month refills. I support that so that they can focus on school, but somebody needs to be responsible to chase those results. If, they're, if the viral load is detectable, that client needs to be called. Okay, so I just want to weave in a few cases to this discussion so that we can sort of bring some reality to these situations. So this is a case of Mandisa that we saw five years ago or so. She was a 16-year-old young woman. She was started in 2011 on ART on AZT3TC nevirapine. That's twice daily, right? She completed her TPT. She looked great. Her adherence was always perfect by pill count. But then when you look into her chart properly, you realize she's had high viral loads for four years. Her CD4, however, maintained a high level with 738. So if we were only using CD4s, we would have completely missed this treatment failure. Um, I want to point this out because this is unfortunately and sort of tragically quite common that we see patients that have had viral loads for very, very many years, 
without a change in regimen and without any um, real intervention. At that point, she was changed to second line. But I just want to remind everybody that as we're continuing a failing regimen in a client, they're accumulating resistance mutations. So how many do you think Mandisa accumulated for those four years while she was not given a different medicine? And will this affect her treatment options in the future? And I would argue yes. So at this point, we're going to move on. We've talked a bit about adherence in our children and adolescents and adults living with HIV. Now I want to move on to talk a little bit about HIV drug resistance. So just reminding everyone that when we begin treatment, if we swallow our pills properly, the viral load falls. All the um, HIV in our body that is sensitive to those drugs will go to sleep, we say, right? If at that point you have any drug resistant HIV in your body, it will maintain a low level for a while and eventually it will rise. Um, when you take away the drug pressure, however, um, oftentimes the wild type or the dark orange virus will wake up again and then you will not be able to see the, uh, the white virus or the resistant virus in the client's blood. We'll talk a little bit about that moving forward when we discuss genotypes. Um, I want to now discuss the NNRTI issue in the country, why we did what we did with adalotegravir. Many of you know in 2016, our first um, drug resistance survey showed that we had greater than 10% resistance to NNRTIs. Um, this is really important because that was our first line in the country. We are continuing to use that medicine for um, prevention of mother-to-child transmission. It seems to be effective. However, in Eswatini, um, by 2018, we had incredibly high levels of NNRTI resistance, specific, specifically in our clients that were exposed to PMTCT. So this is really important to think about as the world moves toward this class of drugs a little bit. We're seeing some of the injectable versions have rolpivirine, and many of our clients have resistance to rolpivirine, which is maintained despite the fact that we're really using very few to no NNRTIs in the country anymore. This is a really important slide that we should just always keep at the back of our mind. And I think we've been very lucky in Eswatini is that we've been early adapters of using some of these more robust drugs. So as you get higher up and further to the right on this slide, you will find the most robust, potent um, drugs that have the highest genetic barrier to resistance. So we're very, very fortunate in that right now, you see Dolotegravir is one of the most um, potent, and um, it is our first line. So if you're infected with HIV today, you can be started on this incredibly strong drug. I think moving forward, we're going to start to see um, darunavir, which is the most potent and robust of all of them, um, introduced into our treatment algorithms a little sooner. Up to now, it's been reserved for third line for our highly treatment experienced clients, um, but we're going to start to see it moving for further in closer to the beginning because um, it's become more accessible, thanks to a lot of advocacy. So uh, where do we get resistance mutations and why are they occurring? So it's important to remember that HIV, like many viruses, produces tons of billions of viruses every day. As it does that, it's, it's doing that in a very sloppy manner. It's making many mistakes when it, does, when it reproduces itself. And, at least one mistake can occur for each cycle of replication. So that means billions of different mutations are formed every day. The reverse transcriptase enzyme has no proofreading mechanism, so it doesn't correct those mistakes. If by chance a random mutation causes resistance to a drug, then it will continue to multiply while the other species are suppressed by the ARVs. This leads to selection of resistant HIV virus. So it's by mistake, but then natural selection just and drug pressure enables that mutated virus to then become the dominant species. So here's another graphic kind of explaining the same point. The top is talking about selected drug resistance, where you maybe have initial wild type virus, which is the light blue in this picture. Um, resistant vi variants then are selected for during therapy, which is the purple. But then when you discontinue the therapy, the wild type reemerges. Transmitted drug resistance, however, means that you were initially infected with a virus that has um, resistance to a certain drug in our regimens. This is what's occurred with the NNRTIs. Interestingly, over time, most P 
people, if untreated, will still revert to wild type. But that does not mean that that initial drug resistant virus is completely gone. It's often just um, quiet. So the only way to figure it out, to find out what is the majority virus in someone's body is to do a genotype. When we do do genotypes, it's important we understand the language that we speak in. Of course, the first letter that we talk about in our HIV drug resistance mutations is the amino acid that is supposed to be at a particular codon. The second uh, thing is a number, and that specifies which codon the mutation has occurred. And the third is the new amino acid that has been replaced. So I'm going to talk about a few of the most common of these um, by drug class. So we'll, we'll first discuss the NRTIs, and then we'll move on to the NNRTIs. So the first NRTI mutation group that I'm going to discuss now is the thymidine analog mutations, or the TAMs. Um, they are induced by AZT, or back in the day, D4T. And these obviously will then lead to resistance to those two drugs. They're cumulative. So the more mutations you have, the more TAMs you accumulate, the higher the resistance to that drug becomes. They occur in clusters or in pathways. The most common, unfortunately, also leads to tenofovir resistance. So starting with AZT and then sequencing to TDF can be challenging. Rather, using AZT later on in regimens sequences makes a little bit more sense when you follow this TAM path. The commonest mutation by far that if you leave this lecture knowing anything, um, you will know this is M184V. The M184V mutation is a single point mutation that gives you resistance to 3TC or FTC, and that leads to a hundred times reduction of the activity of those drugs. It antagonizes the TAM, so it actually increases the susceptibility to the AZTs, the D4Ts, or TDFs. This um, delays resistance to the other NRTIs, so it actually protects them. And it's for this reason and the fact that the M184V mutation reduces the viral fitness that we usually continue 3TC in all of our lines of treatment. So you'll notice that it was part of our first line, it's part of our second line, and it's also part of our third line. It's also an incredibly great surrogate marker of adherence. So when we get a genotype and we don't see this mutation, we have to question whether the client was actually swallowing the medication. Because if they're on 3TC and they don't have M184V, um, I would argue that they're not taking it. Um, the last of the NRTI mutations that I want to talk about today is the K65R. K65R causes intermediate or high-level resistance to tenofovir, but it also gives low or intermediate resistance to abacavir, 3TC, and FTC. Luckily, it increases susceptibility to AZT. So this is another reason why moving AZT down the lines of treatment um, has been done in most of the region. Um, okay, so moving on to the NNRTIs. Um, single, these are single point mutations. They can change the NNRTI binding site. So that's why these, these drugs are very um, quick to become, it's very quick to become resistant to this class of drugs. It also gives full class resistance. What, one of the most common that we see in our clients is the K103N. Um, it leads to both nevirapine and efavirenz high-level resistance, and it's the most common resistance seen in ARV-naive clients uh, in the region. The Y181C mutation um, just knocks out nevirapine. It doesn't lead to high-level efavirenz resistance, but still some resistance. And what's really interesting and very different about the NNRTI resistance uh, mutations is that it doesn't impact viral fitness, so it's often retained. It's able to replicate, you can transmit it with uh, one mutation, and so it, it stays around for a long time. We see it in a ton of our clients, even those that have never been prescribed an NNRTI, um, they retain these mutations. So when we get a genotype, if we don't see M184V, but we do see one of these, K103N or Y181C, that still tells me the client isn't taking their drugs. That does not, the, the presence of these mutations does not imply drug pressure. Also, none of the clients that have been genotyped in Esotini were ever on NNRTIs when they were genotyped. Okay, now moving on to the next class of drugs, the protease mutations. So remember, these are more robust. These are less likely to become high-level resistant very quickly. It takes a couple of years. 
This is because these mutations, again, are cumulative. You need a bunch of them to really create high level resistance. Unfortunately, in this class, there is some cross level resistance. Uh, lupinavir and darunavir are more resilient or more robust than adazanavir. And you remember from that chart, adazanavir was a little further to the left and a little lower on the diagram. You need at least six mutations for most of these to lead to high level resistance. But I want to point out here that we're using darunavir for kind of our last line for most of our clients. If we allow them to fail for a long time on a PI like lopinavir or adazanavir, we may actually be knocking out our, our only other option, which is the darunavir. So again, this is why early identification, early reaction and treatment of high viral loads is essential if we want to maintain lifelong art and keep our clients healthy. Um, finally, I want to talk a little bit about INSTE mutations. Um, when the DTG was brought to the country, uh, the, the thought was really that it has such a high barrier to resistance, we're just not going to see a lot of mutations affecting DTG. And this has become mostly true in our treatment of individuals, but we are seeing resistance emerging in our more treatment experienced clients. And um, in Swaziland, we've actually already identified nine. One of them is uh, an adolescent. The other thing that's important to mention about the INSTEs that I alluded to earlier is to remind you that raltegravir has a much lower barrier to resistance um, than dolutegravir, and it often knocks out the entire class. When we're working in, in resource limited settings, we really need to think about what the next treatment option will be for our clients. Anytime we change medicine or we introduce a new medicine to a client, we need to be sure we know what's next. So in five years, when that client's failing, you have options. This is why the country has decided to kind of move away from RAL. We do have one 11-year-old um, boy who has resistance to every class of drugs that we have in the country. Um, and unfortunately, that occurred because of the use of RAL before pediatric dolotarkavir was available. Um, I also really want to remind everyone on this call that if you have a client on an INSTE like DTG um, and you want to get a genotype, you need to specifically request the INSTE resistance testing. So far, it's not on or not part of the conventional genotype. The conventional genotypes are just including the protease inhibitors. So please specifically write it all over that request form to be sure we're not wasting our resources uh, and we're actually checking for the resistance of the drugs we need to know about. Okay, so let's now move on to discuss genotyping. So I want to remind everyone that when we're genotype testing, we're really only detecting viruses that comprise the majority, at least they need to be at least 10 to 20% of the viral population. This means that it's only gonna tell us information about the virus that's actively replicating. The minority variants or the, resistance, the resistant variants that aren't being selected for may be missed. Also, archive mutations, with the exception of the NNRTIs, which we've already discussed, are usually not detected. Um, so only with selective ARV pressure are we going to get the information that we need. So for this reason, I want to discuss when we should get a genotype. As you know, in Eswatini, when you're wondering if we should get a genotype, you fill out the form and you send it to the National Third Line Committee and the committee will discuss these issues. Um, we want a genotype to exclude drugs. Genotypes do not tell us what will work. They will only tell us about the drugs the patient is currently taking at the time of the sample collection. It will not detect the resistance of minority variants. So you have to be sure that the client's adherent at the time of sample collection, otherwise it's a waste of a test. Um, in a case of advanced HIV disease, if the client perhaps has stopped within four weeks, you could make a case to send it because some of, sometimes the drug levels take a while to uh, go away. And similarly, the resistant virus will hang around for about four weeks. But generally, we want the client to be adherent at the time of sample collection. And the viral load needs to be greater than 1,000 copies. And this is so that it can amplify and the lab can actually identify what mutations are present. Um, just remember that this is an expensive test, so we need to use it cautiously, but we also need to use it early if we think that a client truly has resistance. So that's why we have our committee 
and we're available to answer any questions uh, about certain clients that you may have. So here I want to discuss another case, and we'll talk a little bit about his HIV drug resistance patterns, how we got there, and what we've done about it. So this is a 21-year-old HIV positive male that was referred to us from a private facility in the region. Um, he had, just similar to the other client, many years of high viral loads. And unfortunately, during that time, he had many one-drug substitutions. So he even was given two drugs for periods of time. It was very unclear in his history what he was exposed to, but he was highly treatment experienced. He came to us on AZT, 3TC, lopinavir, ritonavir, which is a really difficult regimen for a lot of reasons. It's a high pill burden. It's twice a day. Um, and he had been on that protease inhibitor for at least five years by the time he came to Baylor. Luckily, he was clinically stable, but his CD4 had already dropped and it was 187. His viral load was incredibly high, 618,325. Generally, with really high viral loads, we assume that resistance is not present and really it's adherence that's causing that high viral load. But in this case, when you have resistance for so long, you absolutely can see resistance even with those really, really high viral loads. So for our first step for this client was to engage our multidisciplinary team, our social workers and our doctors work together with the family, in this case, his mother, and with the client to get a really clear history of what had happened at home, what the social history was. It turns out that this client had had many different caregivers. The mother was also on second line, so had issues with um, discrimination and stigma herself and had failed her first line of treatment. There was a lot of stigma within the family, and the client himself was cognitively impaired um, and didn't understand his own status. So we talked with the family, we empowered them, we explained to them all of the labs and the numbers and what they meant, and they understood that he needed to be on his medicine for at least a month so that we could get this important genotype test. Um, so the mother agreed to that and seemed really empowered and understanding. She made sure that he swallowed all of his pills for a month and they returned to Baylor um, with good adherence this time. Uh, for so here's a quick interlude on interpreting the genotype results in our, in our clients with treatment failure. If on the genotype, they have intermediate or worse resistance to the dolichegravir, the lopinavir, or the atazanavir that they're taking, then we need to build a new regimen based on both the genotype results, but also the treatment history. And then the National Third Line Committee is here to help you do that. If, however, on the genotype, you don't see resistance to those drugs or only low level, generally the client just needs adherence counseling. Um, that being said, with adherence counseling, if the viral load doesn't fall, it's still possible that they have resistant strains in their body. They just weren't the predominant species at the time of sample collection because of adherence issues. So certainly continue to re-engage the committee and consider a genotype in the future once the adherence difficulties have been uh, resolved. Similarly, if a client has advanced HIV disease, there are times where we may just go ahead and switch their medicine, but that's only in extreme uh, circumstances. So we work as a team to make those decisions. So generally, there's a great rule, the one, two, three rule. When you think it's time to genotype, make sure that you know that the viral load is greater than a thousand copies. It's been that way for at least two different times. And that, that's happened at least three months apart with great adherence in between. The adherence piece is key. If we want to get good information from these genotypes, we have to have adherent clients. And I think as a committee, we have about a quarter of the genotypes that we send actually find some resistance mutations that necessitate change of regimen. So that's pretty good. But there are also a, a huge amount of them, even with all of us working together to do our very best, that are wild type. And that will happen. Of course, you know that um, you can just email the SNAP Third Line Committee. Um, the email address is in the guidelines. You're also welcome to refer any pediatric patients to Baylor, but that's no longer necessary. We have um, decentralized the pediatric third line program and effectively um, found at least three pediatric clients uh, in rural facilities and got them initiated on third line treatment. So back to our, our patient, our 21 year old. Um, 
this is his genotype result. So even if you know nothing about interpreting genotypes, you know that this is really bad, right? It's red, red is bad. Um, at the top of the genotype, you're going to see the actual drug res or the actual mutations. The major mutations, which are the ones that are associated with a uh, change in efficacy of medications are listed in bold. Um, you're gonna see a summary page like this, which tells you if there's high level, which is red, intermediate, which is yellow, um, low or potential low or sensitive. But unfortunately in this case, by the time he got to us, he was already very, very resistant to almost everything we had access to in the country. What we do when we get this genotype results is we use a repository of um, correlations between in, um, certain mutations and viral replication. And we use the Stanford database. I urge all of you to go and sort of mess around with this tool. You enter in those bolded mutations by drug class, and it will spit out a um, comprehensive um, efficacy of all of the medications we have in the country. Um, this is what the website looks like. And once you enter in your mutations, you will get both the um, screen you see here, where it lists the uh, inhibitor resistance by high, intermediate, um, or low, but you will also get a table like this, as well as an explanation of each of these major and minor mutations. Um, at the very bottom there, you see all of the protease inhibitors for our patients listed. Each of the mutations that was identified is also listed and assigned point value. Uh, the higher the points for underneath the um, specific drug, the worse that drug will work. Um, for our client. And that's what decides if it's low, intermediate, or high level resistance for each of these medications. So the next step, um, the steps for our client, um, and just a reminder that he really reminded me to scream from the rooftops, we have to identify these kids early, these clients early, and we have to really make sure that we don't destroy future options. As we're switching clients and optimizing clients, let's be sure we know which medications we will use next. If we have any question about that, that's why we work as a team. We can work together to make sure that we have something moving forward. Luckily for this child, Della Tregiver was brought into Swaziland just in time. We had him, we have him on TLD and Darunavir. He's taking the Darunavir twice daily because of that intermediate resistance he had already accumulated but he's now doing great. He's suppressed, he's empowered. He hangs out at the clinic socially almost every day um, and he's doing wonderfully. So it's a success story. Also, please don't forget for these clients, they are at risk of advanced HIV disease. So this is where we have to bring in that whole package of care to support them in every way we can. That means providing TPT, Cotrim when it's indicated, and we follow their CD4s and viral loads more often because, again, we need to respond very swiftly. If there's any change in his life that, you know, keeps his viral load from being suppressed, we need to know about it soon before he ruins his last class of drugs because we have nothing next. Um, all right. So I just want to summarize and remind you of a few take-home take points. The first is uh, that failure is by far and away the most often cause, is most often caused by adherence difficulties. And early detection of that treatment failure prevents the tragic loss of options for our clients like this one. Um, the 11 year old that I spoke about earlier that has resistance to every drug in the country has luckily been enrolled in a clinical trial in South Africa is getting a new medication, new class of medication, um, Fostemsevere, and he is finally suppressed for the first time in his life. But that will not be available for everyone. And um, we really need to be great stewards of these medications to support our patients for their entire lives. We also want to make sure we really feel comfortable using genotypes. We know when to request them. We know when they will be useful. We know what we need to do as the clinical team on the ground before we can ask um, or, or, or draw that, that blood and use that test. Um, I hope that you now remember that commonest mutations, those M184V mutations, the 3TC, um, that's a good marker for adherence, the K65R um, for the TDF and the TAMS for the AZT. And just a reminder to please ask for help, use your mentors, use your 
the doctors at your mother facilities, um, use the third line committee. Let's all talk to one another and do our best in a resource limited setting to provide really effective lifelong art for our clients. I also wanna take this opportunity to invite you all to join our call. We've started a call with regional cases from all over um, Africa actually um, of treatment failure, specifically in kids, but also in um, young adults. Uh, this call is with, with regional experts. We have cases presented every month. Um, you can join the WhatsApp group and you will be in the loop of when those calls are. It's usually one hour from four to five, most often on a Tuesday. Um, and we discuss these complex cases in a variety of settings. Some have more resources than us, um, most have less. So it's a really helpful tool to really become familiar and comfortable with treating these clients. And that's it for me. I would like to take your questions now if there are any questions. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Perry, you can put them in the chat or just um, raise your hand or uh, speak them. Um, I think we could also share the Baylor. We have um, a hotline number that you can call. You're always welcome to call anytime and speak with one of us. So I'll just put it in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, you can always call there in real time. Sarah, I'm just going to ask <clears throat> one thing I think might be nice if you want to mention for everyone, um, just some of the general like rules that we use when we're thinking about when to genotype. Like I, um, when we're looking at a patient with multiple detectable viral loads, when we're thinking now is the time to request for a genotype. You mentioned one where um, an advanced HIV disease, but I think also sometimes we look differently at breastfeeding women, lactating women, or... Yeah, thanks for that, Dr. Mimi. Absolutely. So pregnant and lactating women should get a genotype right away. We have, they ha it has such dire consequences if we don't suppress them that we need to immediately engage the third line committee. You don't have to wait for approval. You can just go ahead and send the genotype if they're on a protease inhibitor or dolichogravir at the time of uh, viral load while pregnant or lactating. And if we need to repeat it at a later date, we can, but, um, but it's really important. Um, okay, here's another question. Um, let me just. Um, okay, this question is thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. Kindly comment on what you would advise for a patient who had log six viral loads, um, SUAC, and then drops to log four and then log two within three months. Would you still do genotyping or would you wait a little bit? to see what happens, I guess, and if so, for how long? Thanks for that question, it's a great one. So I think um, it's important to remember that if ARVs work, by three months, we really expect to see suppression. With dolichogravir, it really could be as early as one month. So if you're seeing a drop in a viral load like that, I actually think that indicates to me that they are taking their pills well and that they can't suppress fully because there is a resistant virus in their body. And I think that's a perfect time to genotype. Um, Dr. Alex, I think you are wanting to answer, ask a question. Hi, Sarah. Great presentation. Um, 
wondering if you could just comment on on what's coming in terms of um, new kind of formulations that might help uh, clients deal with adherence challenges, i.e., sort of injectable long-acting medications, and where those medications may fit in um, for adolescents um, and children in the in this country. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Um, so yeah, there are some exciting um, developments in treatment. And I sort of alluded to that, and maybe that's why you're bringing this up. So uh, the injectable option that's being rolled out in resource-rich countries is an NNRTI-containing rifibrin cap um, regimen. So we do have to just think about that in our treatment experience clients because of our base level NNRTI resistance. Something that I think is coming very soon, both for peds, that's a really big deal, um, but for adults as well, is number one, an FDC of a back of your 3TC DTG for peds, which is gonna be really exciting and reduce the pill burden even more. Um, but secondly, the Darunavir is going to be made uh, an option, I think very soon in the region for most clients in second line. So we're gonna keep much more robust drugs um, at the front line rather rather than starting with weaker drugs, allowing resistance to develop and then moving to the stronger drugs. Um, because of cost, that's that's on the very near horizon for us. Um, one more Oh, another question from Kostin Gipile Matsubula is how do Proteus inhibitors work? <laughs> Hi, Doc. So, yeah, all of the um, the medicine that we use is prevents HIV replication by um, attacking a different part of the viral replication cycle. And the Proteus inhibitors um, affect the packaging after uh, the virus has replicated within the cell. Uh, it, it affects the packaging of the virus into little new virions that are about to get uh, excreted into the blood. Thanks for asking. Sorry, one other question from within our room. Um, someone was asking about how long on a treatment uh, you would expect a client to be failing before you see resistance mutations. Um, so for the protease inhibitors and the dolotegravir, it's about two years. Um, and I think before that time, only in cases of advanced HIV disease would you really even consider a genotype because it's very unlikely that high level resistance has had time to develop. Unless, unless they were co-administered exactly with um, inappropriately with TB or phenobarbital medication. Okay, we have um, a hand raised from Kitoko Nura. Would you like to ask your question? <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation, Sarah. So as, as we are in private sector, when we're suspecting uh, any uh, HIV failure treatment, so uh, the genotype Genotype, genotype uh, test is we have to send the patient to Bella or uh, mm -hmm. any lab can do that genotype test. Oh gosh, thanks so much for asking. And I'm really excited about this forum where we in the public sector and private sector can work together. So you uh, in private sector can absolutely request the test, the genotype test from Lancet. In fact, that's what we do in government as well. We aren't able to do them in our labs yet, though that's something we're working on building capacity for. Um, so you can order the test. Remember that when you order the test without specifically asking, you're not going to get information on the INSTEs on the dolotegravir. So you need to specifically ask for that to be added to the genotype. Um, it is an expensive test. We in the public sector are very, very happy, though, to work with you on managing these clients. So if you feel like you need a genotype, you are absolutely welcome to just order it. If you'd like support from us, we are here and so happy to collaborate. So you don't have to refer them to us at all. You're welcome to if you prefer to do that. Or we can even just chat and manage, um, you know, remotely and support you. I'm also happy someone just asked about sharing the slides, and I'm, I'm happy to share them. I don't, maybe I'll send them through the Dr. Matunjwa. Thank you.
Okay, thanks everyone so much. Um, I, I hope that this was helpful. I know it was very basic. I and the team are very, very happy to chat with you um, anytime about any of these treatment failure cases. And I really, really encourage you to join that call with case discussions. We have had doctors from all over Swaziland presenting cases, and I think it helps build all of our capacity and makes us feel more comfortable. None of them are straightforward. Every client is unique. And um, I think by the cases are just the absolute best way for us as adult learners to internalize this information. So I hope you all will join. And it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much.